This morning we get a special treat because we follow what is known as the traditional one-year lecture. In other words, the readings that we have are assigned for the same Sundays after Trinity, year after year. And we get to have uh, variations when particular saints days fall on a Sunday. But today, because we are using the 1789 Common Prayer, we get to see one of the few places where the lectionary has changed since 1549. If this was the regular 1928 prayer book lectionary, we would be doing the story of the, of the uh, son who sells all of his dead stuff and spends it on riotous living uh, and then comes back as a repentant son and is received by his father. That reading replaced in 1928 <coughs> the reading that was read today, the story of the unjust steward. So I don't usually get to preach on this. And the first instinct when you read this particular lesson is that it feels kind of smarmy and it seems like Jesus is commending people to be not good. It seems like the steward, who is apparently not doing a good job, has decided rather than making an honest living after being dismissed as the steward, is being commended for being crafty. How is he crafty? Well, first he goes to the people and he realizes that he can't, he's too proud of bag and he doesn't want to dig. In other words, he doesn't want to do manual labor. Maybe he's not able to because he's just not physically fit or has the skill. Because he can't do either of those things, he decides rather than making an honest living, he's going to go and make friends with those who owe money to his master by cutting their bill. This, of course, is dishonest. And it feels kind of grungy for us to think that somehow Jesus is commending this kind of dishonesty. But in fact, what Jesus is doing is setting it up as a comparison. He's not saying that we all should be deceitful or that we should somehow try to gain advantage by doing things that aren't a good idea or perhaps even illegal. Obviously, Jesus would not recommend illegal or immoral activity. But rather what he is talking about is the bigger reality that people are going to do things on earth and be really crafty about it. Why in the world don't we have the same amount of effort and energy towards doing good things? In other words, the commendation that Jesus gives in this particular story isn't that we should be wicked and make friends with famine. Because he does say at the end that the reward for this person is going to be an eternal habitation. And unfortunately, the earth of eternal habitation is damnation, not salvation. But Jesus is telling us that we too need to be true. In other words, we need to learn how to deal with others. We learn to need to learn how to be good businessmen or businesswomen. We need to learn how to be good at what we do in order not to get ahead ourselves, but to glorify God. And there is in fact a reward for such behavior. We don't earn eternal life. Please don't ever say, Father Kelly said we should work real hard and get to heaven. We should work real hard and we should get to heaven, but you don't earn heaven by working hard. Rather, we are saved by grace. Jesus Christ has already accomplished our salvation on the hard wood of the cross. It is a free gift to us. It's the gift of grace. If you take the confirmation class, I'll fill you in on how that works. But this free gift is ours for the taking by faith. But we learn how to work. And we learn how to do these sort of things because we want to be pleasing to God. We work and we learn how to do these things in order to glorify Him in our daily lives. If we love our spouse, we want them to be happy. If we love our family, we do what's best for them. And if we love our Heavenly Father, we should be doing things in our lives that please Him. Why? Because we love Him and He loves us first. Why would I want to act as if I really do love them. The secondary effect, of course, of this good behavior is that we become, it becomes
becomes second or should say first nature. Our fallen condition drives us towards sinfulness. Our fallen condition makes us want to do things that are selfish. But when we are learning to do goodness, when we are learning to do righteousness, when we are learning to love our neighbors as ourselves, and to be patient, and to be kind, and to be merciful, when we do all of these things, as we learn, they become a part of our very nature. It becomes instinctual for us to act according to God's will and purpose. I'm not saying we will always do it. We know many times when we will fail, and we will sin, and we will fall short of the glory of God. But having become the practice of living the spiritual life, we will recognize those sinful moments quicker, be faster to repentance, and to ask God for forgiveness to amend our lives. We begin to put ourselves in a position where we more deeply understand how it is God wants us to live. And then having done all that, having done all of that, we begin to not only glorify God with our lives and our being, but we begin to attract people to Jesus Christ by the way that we live. Now, actually when you're living goodness, when you're living holiness, there will be some people who will find it objection. Those who do not want anything to do with goodness and holiness will find your attempt to be good an offense. Love them anyway, and try to love them right into the life of Jesus Christ. But don't let them distract you. Rather, continue to work and to be an example of this love, so that when you do so, they will have nothing against you. And when God does touch their life in a way that they can't resist, they will know that you're something they can come to in order to find out more about who Jesus Christ is. In your bulletin, in the Chronicle, is a copy of the story that is put in our cornerstone. And in it, the founders of this parish believe that it was important to erect this glorious edifice so that God could be glorified and worshipped from generation to generation. The text is in the bulletin, but as I paraphrase it, they go on to say that they know that the Episcopal Church, being so grounded in the scriptures and the doctrines of the ancient church, will continue to do things good and holy in right proportion. And no matter how unworthy we may prove ourselves, Jesus Christ will be glorified throughout all ages. Just as these views at one time we're filled with people who have been dead all of them for probably a hundred years now. Think of that. The pew you're sitting in has been occupied by dozens and dozens of families. And they're all dead. And someday you will be too. And God willing, will be all new people in this world. And they will glorify God. The good news is that the same reason they were here is the reason we are here now. Because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Let us be shrewd. Let us be like that steward, not in doing evil, but in always thinking ahead to how we can glorify God. In doing so, we will receive the same exact reward that every other person before us has received. Not because they worked hard, not because they kept the building beautiful, not because they produced beautiful music and glorious worship, but because they love Jesus. Because they love Jesus, they have gone home to be with Him. May it be so for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.